What is a complete human? Is it a cover model? Is it a science geek? Is it a fitness expert? Or all of the above and more? Jana and Evan are crusaders that walk the earth looking at today's issues that touch our hearts and minds. The honest and hopeful outlook on the advancement of today's society. The science behind the decay of human relationships. The necessary preparations for future generations. Join us as we look deep inside ourselves and embark on a journey into becoming a complete human. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. For a long time, you guys have seen Jana and I stand naked in front of some red lights, and we've got a lot of questions about that. Um, it's her, not red light district. It's not the red light district, um, although there's probably some photos of that floating around out there as well. So we've had a couple conversations about photobiomodulation, red light therapy, and we've gotten so many questions about it. What does it do? How does it work? What are the real benefits of that? And so as photobiomodulation becomes more of a topic in the world of health and wellness, we decided that we were going to go to, uh, we're going to go out in the world, we're going to find the companies that we thought were the best in the business and, uh, you know, get one of them on the show. And so we are stoked today to have Scott, uh, the CEO and founder of Mito Red Light on the show. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, us too. So we've been standing naked in front of your red light for a while. Um, Fantastic. Yes. And, and there might be some B-roll on that later in the show. <laughs> With some blurred. Uh, With some blurred, blurred images. Words. So um, Scott, before we kind of get into the whole science of red light, we'd love to learn a little bit about you, your background, and what got you excited about you know this particular element of health and wellness. Okay. Uh, it's a bit of a long story. I'll try to give the concise version, but you know, I've been interested in health and wellness for as long as I could remember. I mean, I kind of the origin stories for me go all the way back to childhood. I grew up in very modest circumstances, originally from New York city, I was raised by a single mom. Um, you know, and, you know, as a child of the eighties, you know, uh, kind of the four food groups were, um, you know, sugary cereal, soda pop, fast food and TV dinners, you know, so <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't know. And, um, and certainly, you know, my health suffered in retrospect, my health suffered for that. I had a lot of uh, challenges as a kid, missed a lot of school, had trouble keeping up. Um, in spite of all that, you know, um, I feel like I should preface this by saying, you know, I, <laughs> my mother did an amazing job. She had me at 19 and, you know, she showered me with love, which is the most important nutrient that a kid needs. And as a parent now, um, and with considerably more resources and financial and otherwise, um, I'm just astonished at what she did as a single parent. So I love you, mom. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, those days we didn't know what we didn't know. And so some of our dietary and high lifestyle habits were suboptimal, to say the least. And, um, you know, I struggled. I struggled in school. I struggled athletically. And, you know, even into my 20s, I struggled with just accomplishing my goals. I realized that how I felt every day, which was not good, uh, was really getting in the way of me accomplishing the things that I wanted to accomplish. So I felt like step one was to trying to figure out why I felt like crap all the time and why I was, um, you know, I had really horrible acne, which I think was my reaction. Obesity is a problem, childhood and otherwise. And I think the standard American diet for a lot of people results in obesity. For me, it was acne, really horrible acne. And just, uh, just exhaustion, like, you know, struggling through every day. So those problems uh, really launched me on a path to try and find solutions. So I learned a lot, owned a supplement company back in the day, um, kind of got out of that business uh, and just constantly self-experimenting, uh, tinkering with myself, trying to figure out what would work. And really uh, what got me interested in light was um, just insomnia. I had the worst insomnia pretty much all into my 20s. And uh, I was really on this horrible seesaw of um, caffeine to get through the day, alcohol to put myself asleep, um, you know, binge drinking and all these things that were just counterproductive. And um, I just, and I tried all sorts of pharmaco pharmacological solutions, melatonin, which I heard you mentioning when we jumped on. Um, you know, I tried NyQuil, I tried, you know, every sort of sleepy time tea, I mean, you name it, right? I tried everything. And it wasn't until I bought an $8 pair of red glasses and I started shielding the lights in the evening from my eyes that I started to sleep better. So it was fascinating to me that it cost basically nothing and it was essentially a life-changing uh, strategy or implementation. So that really opened up your eyes. 
Pun intended. Yes. Pun intended. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you buy these $8 pair of glasses, and we've definitely seen those out there. And, and I think the science behind that is really sound, right? When we start blocking blue light, we allow our cortisol switch to shut off, our melatonin switch to shut on. We actually kind of get into some better sleep patterns. But how did you make that jump from, you know, a, a pair of glasses into this emerging field, which really, when we look at the his, history of it, it's, it's not that emerging. It's been around a long time. But I think as the science has evolved and we understand kind of the nuts and bolts of photobiomodulation, how did you make that jump from glasses to where you're at now? Well, a couple things. I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, really struggling for a, a decade with inability to sleep and, um, and having it be solved by something so simple really I mean, it's very humbling, frankly, you know, it's like, it was such an obvious, in retrospect, such an obvious thing, but um, that had completely eluded me. And it really just kind of opens my mind. And I still try to keep my mind open, like, what other obvious things are we missing? All right. I mean, this is such an obvious thing in retrospect, you know, this bright light in the evening, very unnatural, it's screwing us up, it's jacking up our circadian rhythm. And yet, you know, light bulbs are ubiquitous, and we don't even think about it. And so, you know, we, we suffer the consequences, right? So what else am I missing, particularly around light? So I started to really learn a little bit more about light and, um, and about the electromagnetic spectrum in, in general and how it, the different parts of the spectrum affect us. And we sh really should talk about that to kind of lay the foundation for, for your listeners, because you know, it's not just blue light. I mean, there's UVB, UVA, and then obviously these certain wavelengths of red and the infrared that we know have certain biological action. So the science is there. Uh, we just really need to understand it, at least at a high level, and then just implement some very simple strategies to really kind of leverage the knowledge. Well, yeah. let's, let's dive into that then, because I, I think that, you know, we've talked a lot about blue light. And, you know, obviously we know that our greatest source of blue light is the sun. Uh, but I think that, you know, uh, we've kind of demonized TV and devices for the blue light, but I, I think it's really the interaction of that blue light that's causing so many problems, as you pointed out. It's, it's light bulbs, it's TV, it's our cell phone as we're climbing into bed, which has that problem to dis or has that ability to disrupt our circadian rhythm. So, you know, I'd love for you to touch a little bit more on the light spectrum itself and then, you know, kind of what we're seeing as far as, you know, how do these different lights impact us uh, physiologically? Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So we'll, we'll, we'll start at a high level and we can zoom in on certain parts. So you've got the electromagnetic spectrum. And so if you're listening, you can go on Wikipedia and Google it. Um, and you've got gamma rays, you've got x-rays, and then you've got the ultraviolet light part of the spectrum. Then you've got the visible part of the spectrum. Then you've got, uh, which is, you know, Roy G. Biv. Then you've got infrared, you've got microwave, and you've got radio waves. So that's the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So when we think about the parts that we know that impact our biology, it's pretty much every part of the spectrum, but they impact us in different ways. So obviously gamma rays, X-rays, we know ionizing radiation. You know, we know that the connection with increased cancer risk with people that get a lot of exposure uh, to ionizing radiation, that's pretty well understood and uh, inarguable at this point. And then when we get into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, this is the part where you know, we start talking about the sun and, and where some people have concerns about sun exposure. You've got UVC, UVB, UVA, UVB, uh, which is responsible for vitamin D synthesis. So we know that that's very important, especially with what we've gone through the past year and a half. Wait, wait, what's and, that? Uh, <laughs> you may have heard this thing. It's been on the news. It's a viral issue. Um, anyway, <laughs> and I actually wrote an article about vitamin D. We could talk about that uh, as well. But so UVB, very important uh, for vitamin D synthesis at only at certain times of the year, at certain times of the day, uh, but can also cause burning, right? So there's, you know, the dose makes the poison, right? And then uh, UVA gets overlooked, but, you know, they've done, I don't know if you're familiar with the studies they did out of the UK, uh, where they controlled for vitamin D levels and they were still finding higher cardiovascular risk in the higher latitudes. And they, they chalked it up to UVA. And it's because UVA, when it hits the skin, now it doesn't cause vitamin D synthesis, but it does cause nitric oxide production in the skin and in the blood. And, you know, you know I, I'm sure you, I, actually, I know that you guys know about nitric oxide because you have a product called Red, Resbeat, which tastes fantastic, by the way. I have to give my hats off to you guys for oh, uh, the formulation there. I really like <laughs> the, the benefits of beets, beets without getting punched in the face with the taste of beets. So I really, uh, <laughs> yeah. my hats off to oh, that. To God, it's like, it's, you know, I, uh, <laughs> did, you, did you ever see the original Point Break movie with uh, Keanu Reeves? and? Uh, I remember it. I remember it, Patrick. He Slater. has a line from that movie where he said it's like eating the ass out of a dead rhino. <laughs> And that, in my mind, is what eating a beet is like. <laughs> Which is so funny because I feel like people either love them or they hate them. I'm one that actually, I love the taste of beets, so, but I love the taste fan. of fresh beet too. 
Um, not a but, huge fan, but but well, but yeah, it's like the black cherry flavor. Whatever, whatever you guys did, the app, whatever, a little bit of apple flavor, whatever you did, it's it's a good yeah. product. So okay. thank, you. thank you. So Two much. thumbs up. Two thumbs up. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're definitely huge fans of nitric oxide and and you know what it does to the body. So you know, mm-hmm. let's can can and we'll yeah, that path. yeah, we'll talk we'll talk a little bit about that too because nitric oxide is again everything is you know and needs to be in balance and there's actually a problem with too much nitric oxide in the mitochondria. So so in any case, sunlight we know we need for for vitamin D. Uh, we know that modest amounts with, of the UVA is good for nitric oxide. So you could get some sun and get some beets, probably best to do a little bit of both. And then we get into the, the visible spectrum. Um, and we, we talked about blue light and its impacts on circadian rhythm. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is first thing in the morning, get up and go say hello to the sun, kind of reboot my circadian rhythm. It's part of my kind of routine. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm avoiding the blue light in the evening um, with blue blocking glasses and just our whole house turns red. So uh, it's a little, the neighbors probably think we're a little strange, but it is. It is right? <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then we get into infrared. So when it comes to red light therapy, there's actually something called the optical window. And, and this is part of kind of the magic. So you can go on Wikipedia, you can check out optical window, but it's, it's in, it's a medical um, physics term. And it's basically below 600 nanometers, which is basically below orange. You get minimal penetration. Okay, and, and what, what penetration there is, is uh, of those wavelengths of light is absorbed by hemoglobin. And above 1100 nanometers, which is in near infrared, is um, you, you get penetration, but you get a lot of water absorption, and that's what causes the heating. So the, that energy above 1100 nanometers, and this is why they use, you know, uh, far infrared in saunas, for instance, you know, it's, it's that heating effect, and that's way up, probably like around 10,000 nanometers. Um, But so there's this optical window between 600 nanometers and around 1100 nanometers where you get the penetration, but you don't get the water absorption. So the energy can go deep into the body and act on the mitochondria. And this is why all of the devices in the space, or or it's one of the reasons why all the devices in the space are using, you know, light in that very narrow window. Um, So uh, that's an important thing to understand and why it's not an accident that you'll see all of these devices using essentially red light between six and 700 nanometers and typically near infrared between eight and 900. Um, the other reason why you'll see between six and 700 and eight and 900 is um, there's a, even though there's a dearth of clinical studies showing benefit between seven and 750 for some reason, I don't even know why that is, but um, so you'll rarely find people using those, those wavelengths. So it's typically six to 700 red and then eight to 900 near infrared. Um, okay, so I think we, we kind of went through the big picture. I don't know if you have questions about the big picture, and I, we can narrow down to and talk about what happens when we expose the body to red and near infrared light in these narrow bands. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, j- just so we kind of even dumb it down a little bit more, when we talk about these wavelengths, right, we're really just talking about the, you know, it, we, we talk about the peaks and valleys of the wavelength, right? So it's just the, um, you know, if you it's, it's it literally the distance between uh, the wavelength. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So 600 billionths of a meter, uh, we view as orange-ish, right? Um, so yes, that's what we're talking about. And it's, and it's um, inversely uh, proportional to the, to the frequency, right? So anyways, I, I like to think of it in terms of actual billionths of a meter. That's how I visualize it. That's small. Um, it's very, very small. It's very, very small. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, I, so that's the groundwork. So why is, you know, red light therapy potentially beneficial? So I, there's a, there's clinical evidence and then there's kind of anecdotal evidence and then there's my own opinion. So we're, we're going to walk through kind of, I think all three of those uh, through, the, <laughs> through the discussion. So, uh, you know, and I, I'll try to um, di- uh, dictate which one uh, we're talking about. So as far as kind of the, the science behind it, like the proven science, um, these bands of energy, uh, primarily act on the mitochondria. So that's, that's where the magic is happening. So if you think about, uh, if you're familiar with the electron transport chain and um, an ATP production, which occurs in the mitochondria. So for those that don't know, the mitochondria are the power plants of the cell. Uh, and so they make ATP, which is the essentially cellular energy. So what, uh, there's a chromophore, and a chromophore is just a fancy word for a light absorbing molecule called uh, cytochrome C oxidase. Okay, and so this is inside mitochondria, and it's part of the the fourth phase of cellular respiration, or the fourth part of ATP ATP production. 
So what happens is the light goes into the mitochondria. And remember, it can get there because below 600 nanometers, we don't get any penetration. But above 1100 nanometers, it's getting absorbed by water, turned into heat. But this, these wavelengths of light can get, can get to the mitochondria in the tissues and act on cytochrome C oxidase. And there's two primary things that they do while they're there. And uh, so this gets back to the nitric oxide story. So I am a big fan of nitric oxide, uh, a big fan of uh, improving the power of the saber. And, uh, <laughs> and, and certainly I've noticed that. So, so again, good stuff. Uh, but, you know, but too much of anything or too much of it in the wrong places isn't necessarily a good thing. So one place where we don't want too much nitric oxide is inside the mitochondria. And the reason for that is that this uh, enzyme or chromophore, cytochrome C oxidase, it uh, needs to combine with oxygen in order to finish making ATP. But inside the mitochondria, nitric oxide and oxygen compete for affinity with cytochrome C oxidase. So if cytochrome C oxidase is bound with nitric oxide, you're not going to make the ATP. So the magic that the red and near infrared light is they go in and they decouple the nitric oxide and the cytochrome C oxidase. So there's more cytochrome C oxidase floating around available to bind with oxygen to finish making ATP. So that's essentially what happens inside the mitochondria uh, on, on that side of things. And so again, so nitric oxide, good, too much of it in the in mitochondria, potentially problematic if it's you know, in, interfering with ATP production. Um, there's two other things, and I don't, I don't know if I'm getting too down into the weeds, but it's, no, not this at is, all. This, yeah, this is okay. Um, there's another thing that happens and that, um, with respect to protons in the mitochondria, when, when near, red and near-infrared light, you know, hit the mitochondria, um, there's, there's essentially, it increases the inner mitochondrial membrane potential. Uh, say that three times fast, right? <laughs> um, and essentially all that means is it's taking protons and it's um, bumping them out. So there's, a, there's the inner mitochondria and there's inner mitochondrial membrane and then there's an outer mitochondrial membrane. So it's taking, there's a cluster of protons and there's, there's homeostasis generally, right? Bodies always look for homeostasis. So you've got protons in, in the inner, inner uh, section and it's mudging them out across the inner mitochondrial membrane to the space between the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. So you wind up with this um, imbalance of protons hanging out in this upper space, if you will, and it creates potential energy. So then when those protons go to move back, you know, they, everything's looking for a homeostasis, right? So there's an imbalance. They want to go back to balance. They move back across the inner mitochondrial membrane and the mitochondria actually use that energy uh, to make ATP. So those are kind of the two uh, things that are happening within the mitochondria to really kind of drive ATP production, which is the, generally accepted as the primary mechanism for the, old, the underlying benefits of red and near infrared light therapy. Gotcha. That's, that's in depth. <laughs> that's in depth. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that we've talked so much about is mitochondrial dysfunction and how mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the keys to metabolic inflexibility. Or, and so, you know, obviously balancing that, like one of the things you just, you just said is homeostasis. That's what we're always looking for. Lifestyle, environment, all of the things that we've kind of cocked up um, ha have caused that dysfunction. And so, you know, when we really look at it, I I'd love to kind of address, in your opinion, how does, how does red light really help drive that desire for that cell to kind of come back to homeostasis? You know, we, we can talk about the mechanism of action, but on a grand scale, what are we really seeing in the research that says, you know, your mitochondria will become more, uh, more stabilized, you're producing better, you know, you've got better ATP production, you've got better uh, mitochondrial function. What does that mean holistically for ourselves as a, as a you know, human being? Well, it... it <laughs> I think to the extent that we can leverage environmental inputs to make energy more efficiently, we're going to be better off. Just, just carte blanche. I mean, I think that's a, that's a fair statement. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of what we're doing in modern life is getting in our own way with either, with the wrong environmental inputs, whether it's diet or, or light, uh, or, you know, obviously the, the toxins that we deal with that we need to get rid of. So, um, you know, as far, it, as far as, you know, it, it it sounds a little bit too good to be true because at the end of the day, like if you look at the research and there's over 5,000 studies that I'm aware of at the moment, um, the application seems so broad based. It's like this, this can't even, how is this even possible? And, and I was very skeptical actually when I first came across this and, you know, I, I but I'm the type of person, again, I, I'll just try it. I'll just, I tried firsthand. I have to give it a try. And I actually, my original impetus for trying it was testosterone. 
uh, production. There was an article by a well-known biohacker like four years ago about that. I was like, ah, I'll try it. So, um, but you know, if, if you really understand how it works, if you can essentially make, if you can create more mitochondria and that's, that's it's been shown to do that. And if you can help the mitochondria, you, you know, that mitochondria using this energy to make ATP, if you're helping the mitochondria make ATP, then the cells are just going to be more efficient at doing their jobs, whatever it is that their job is, mm-hmm. whether it's a skin cell or, or uh, you know, a liver cell or whatever. Yeah. So, so that actually brings up a great question because uh, I'm very familiar with that article that you were referencing, and and you know we we had uh, that uh, that guy on our show last week, friend of show. So we're uh, you know, cool. Um, but you know what has been your experience? Because I think that's one of those things we see with red light is this emergence of oh, it's going to increase testosterone. You know what? No, what I, well, I, I I disagree completely. I, and 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 I I love that guy. I mean, I, I and I fo- followed his work obviously for several years, but I. You know, I think there's this, this tendency in this space to really, um, you know, to always be looking for the next uh, great thing. And, and, you know, and unfortunately, there can be a lot of, uh, you know, the cart gets before the horse where in terms of, uh, you know, we maybe there's promise, but there, the data just isn't there. And, and the data just isn't there when it comes to testosterone. I mean, there's a couple of rat studies that like, uh, you know, they, for five days. And it's, it's interesting, like you see these massive increases and, but it's, you know, it's a rat study. So uh, for me, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm it, I mean, the deluge of information, misinformation, disinformation, and confusing information that's out there. You know, I try to really focus my attention on you know the strength of evidence, and I and, and even the articles we write, we we focus primarily on randomized control trials, and there are plenty. And you know, we can have a good discussion about RCTs in humans where we're showing benefit, but for testosterone, it's just not there. Now, as far as anecdotes go, I've got two anecdotes in two and a half years in this business, which are promising, actually. You know, like, uh, but both uh, two men, one was in his 30s, one was in his 50s, and they were in like low, their testosterone was low, it was in the 300s. And one, and both used the light for about six weeks. One went to f- high 500s, one in, went into the 600s. And this is where we actually have labs. And, and we have, I know what light they use and they were using it for six weeks and they shared the labs and I think they even posted reviews, but, you know, I, fortunately it's two people in two and a half years, you know, out of thousands of customers, though, it's not, it's not a huge data set yet. And my, and so, okay, so that's the, the, the clinic, the, there's no clinical evidence basically in humans that I'm aware of at all for testosterone. I've got two anecdotes. And then, so in, in my world of speculation, my, my, just my sense is, is that it's just not going to, if you're already in normal. It, my sense is it's not going to do much. Yeah. If you're if you're already low, if you're low, then potentially maybe there's potential it could support you in getting to a normal range. So that's just my opinion based on you know what I've seen so far. Well, that makes sense, right? I, I mean, ultimately I mean, if- you're optimizing. You're yeah. optimizing your 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 system. So if you can, then that would help you if you need it. But if you're already optimized, is there much room for growth? You know, I, I, I bought one of the red lights that came, you know, it was just like the circle red lights. And, you know, I shined it on my nuts for a while and it did <laughs> nothing for my testosterone. So, like, you know, uh, you know yeah, they're, they're, my end of one says no, but yep. well, mine too. To begin with. Mine too. I mean, my testosterone floats in the mid 500s, you know, which mm-hmm. is not super high. It's not low, but it's, it's just kind of where I'm at at 46. Yeah. yeah. So let then let's move into the stuff that we know that it does, right? You know, so so let's 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 kind of kick testosterone to the side for a little bit and let's talk about what are the real clinical, you know, randomized double blind placebo controlled clinical trials where we see benefit of red light. Where can people expect to integrate this into their life and know that there's going to be some profound, you know, improvement in their health and wellness journey? Okay. So all right, well let's let's talk about the other kind of primary way that it works. Because I think it's important understanding kind of like the applications. So we talked about ATP, and that's kind of the that's basically understood across the realm. The other important way that it works is through this idea of hormesis. So um, similar to exercise, right? So what happens when uh, when red and near infrared light hit a mitochondria or hit the cell? There actually is an increase in uh, reactive oxygen species or free radicals, right? Now, generally speaking, people hear that and they think that, oh, that's bad, you know, because that causes aging and, you know, it's, um, it's, it causes inflammation. And the, the, but it's not necessarily true. Again, it's all about dose and it's all about balance, right? So it's a transient uh, increase. And what happens is there's, uh, so the, my, let's see if I like, uh, kind of explain this in layman terms. The mitochondria, there's an increase in ROS, and part of that might be mediated by the release of nitric oxide within the mitochondria, right? And so the mitochondria is like, ah, you know, something's going on here. And it sends a signal 
to the nucleus of the cell, says, hey, you know, there's something weird going on here. Maybe you should upregulate some of your antioxidant and anti-inflammatory uh, pathways. Why don't you get to work making some of those just in case, right? And so if the dose, and this is where the biphasic dose response comes in, if, and if you're familiar with this, but you know, you don't want too much, uh, you don't want too little, you don't want too much either. So we're, we're looking for the amount of energy to hit the mitochondria where that retrograde signaling happens. It's telling the nucleus, hey, you know, why don't you go ahead and start like upregulating these anti-inflammatory, anti antioxidant pathways, just in case. Then the nucleus does that. And so we get this down, downstream effect of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant benefits uh, due to this transient increase in, in ROS. And so that, that's an important part of how it works because we do see a lot of kind of like anti-inflammatory, antioxidant benefits, like with respect to certain, uh, like things like arthritis, for instance, you know? And so if we can get some of those anti, anti-inflammatory signaling happening, that's gonna potentially benefit things like arthritis and pain. And remind us again, how far is the light actually penetrating the skin? Like, can it get to a bone? Can it get to a tendon? Uh, well, gosh, so that's a complicated question because it really depends on the power of the light and which mm -hmm. wavelengths. Okay. So the, um, so even within the optical window, there's different depths of penetration. So typically speaking between six and 700 nanometers, which again is kind of orange to deep red, uh, it's only a couple of millimeters. Okay. So that's acting on the skin, things like the hair follicles, like the helmets that the, you'll see on the market, they're using red light to stimulate hair growth. Um, Whereas infrared, particularly between seven and 850 is um, where you get the deeper penetration. And you can get, I think in the studies, the, the furthest they've been able, able to penetrate is about five centimeters at 810 nanometers. So that's an interesting, uh, and it, it's actually driving the, um, we're, we're coming out with a new product that's geared toward um, muscle recovery. It's geared toward performance in general, cognitive and physical. And we're, we're using 810 nanometers a lot in that light because it, it has been shown to penetrate the deepest, uh, but even that's a few centimeters. So let's talk a little bit about the cognitive piece because I know that there's been some emerging research on um, photobiomodulation for cognitive benefit. What research are you guys seeing for that? Well, that's funny. I, I have this doctor who's uh, emailing me uh, on a regular basis, trying to convince me to come out with a helmet for this. Uh, and uh, and so uh, what we're seeing is uh, low 800 nanometers as far as the depth of penetration. And there's a product on the market called the V-Light. And they, I believe they use 810 nanometers. And that's just, they've got a couple, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they've got a couple different spots here and on the side of the head. And they also shoot it up the nose. And, uh, and th there's a lot of promising research on with respect to that. And I, I'm actually in the middle of kind of writing that as part of the product launch. So I'm still kind of getting in the weeds. So I can't kind of uh, pull a, an RCT off the shelf. But I, I can say that the pen, uh, there's a reason why V-Light uses A10 nanometers. That product is specifically geared toward cognitive health. And um, it's exciting. And I think the interesting thing about the brain is, uh, so if we go out in midday sun, you know, and we're getting and out, out here right now, it's, it's pretty heavy sun, uh, only about one and a half percent of that energy actually makes it to the brain. So the interesting thing about the brain, is it's obviously because it has to go through the skull, so the interesting thing about the brain is that because the brain is not exposed to a lot of light energy, just in a normal course of business, it's actually quite sensitive. So if you can get anything there, then there's, there's really potential that you can move the needle on things. So, um, so I think it's exciting. You know, I, I don't know that the helmet is, is high on my list right now because it is a very, but it is, I could see potentially coming out with something like that at some point. Um, and, you know, clearly the, um, these neurodegenerative diseases are for whatever reason on the rise. And so we, we need to figure something out. I have, I actually happen to think that a lot of it's due to really poor sleep. Um, just because, you know, you actually clean your brain when you're sleeping. And if you're not getting good sleep, you're not taking out the garbage that I think that that could um, cause problems in the long term. But, but, you know, to the extent that we might be able to implement some of these new technologies, it is exciting. No, you know, and I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Scott. It's, you know, we've talked a lot about the glymphatic system here and, you know, how, all of this blue light activation is causing poor sleep problems, which is causing, you know, uh, poor sleep quality, which then, you know, leads to a, a lack of that, you know, clearing out. And so, uh, I, you know, I saw a report that showed that the highest incidence of uh, pre, pre Alzheimer's dementia cognitive decline was actually in gamers. So these kids that are sitting around for like 16 uh, hours a day, it makes perfect a chair, sense, you know. Yeah. 
blue Dude, light, blue light, yeah. you know, drinking, you know, Red Bull by the case, sedentary lifestyles, no exposure to natural light. It's, you know, it's clearly, this is an epidemic that's coming down the pike. And then on top of that, we throw distance learning and everything that our kids have gone through in the last year. It's, um, you know, wh- I think what we're really looking for is how do we take the technology available to us and start to offset some of the problems that we have created through technological evolution. And, and clearly red light has a place in all of this. Totally agree. Totally agree. I mean, the, the gamers are a perfect example, but I think, you know, even I, I, the, I think the statistic is the average person spends 90% of their time indoors. And so, I mean, I would argue we're sunlight deficient. I mean, we're just sunlight deficient, period. And so what does that really mean? I mean, it's, it's, there's vitamin D, like we talked about in UVB. There's, there's the nitric oxide, like we talked about with UVA. There's the blue light with respect to, you know, um, the, your circadian rhythm. And then there's the red and near infrared. I mean, and that's just what I know. I'm sure that there are many, many other things that are, are impacting us with respect to lack of sunlight. So I do think, so with that as the background and with that as the reality, I do think some uh, mindful supplementation makes sense of these things. And that's really where I, you know, I kind of think like red and near infrared light supplementation, if you will, makes a lot of sense because, you know, if you're just spending all day indoors, you're not getting it from the sun. Mm-hmm. Not to mention that the, it, the sun is, is a difficult place because unfortunately the sun does come packaged with the UV rays, which can cause burning and it does, you know, and the sun peaks at 500 nanometers. So it's not, it's not, a, uh, which is green light. So it's not a super awesome source of red and near infrared light. So I think, you know, we can take our knowledge and tweak our lifestyles by adding in a little bit of this. And I think that it would benefit a lot of people. So let's say you are someone who does spend more time outside, you get sunlight, you, you know, you're getting fresh air and, and your skin seeing the sun. Is there a benefit to those people using red light as well? Uh, yes. So I, um, absolutely. Although my, and I don't have data to prove this, but again, my, um, intuition tells me that those people in general would benefit less, right? Because they're getting, they're less deficient would be how mm-hmm. I would describe it. Having said that, and this is where my, my vitamin D article, we're prompted my vitamin D article is just my uh, unexpected uh, vitamin D results that I had, that I, I had some blood tests on recently. And um, so what I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story really quick. And so I, I tested in February and my, uh, I think I, I tested at 82 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, and so if you guys are familiar with that, it's like uh, the, the re- reference range is 30 to 80. So 80 is very high I and mean, it's actually abnormally high. And then I uh, was like, that can't be right. Like, I, I can't believe it's that high because I don't take vitamin D supplements. That's an important uh, thing to know. I, I, it's a whole nother thing. I think if people take supplements, they need to test regularly. It's, you know, it's all the stuff. It's really easy to overshoot. Yeah. Uh, and I also think that it's a Band-Aid. Like, the, I think vitamin D deficiency, your body's trying to tell you you're not getting enough sun. So I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm generally against pills, but uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't give medical advice. So everybody's situation is different, but I think the, for me, if you get low vitamin D levels, your body's telling you you're not getting enough sun. So I would say, try to get a little bit more sun. And then if you maybe take some vitamin D, potentially that's a good idea, but personally, that's not something I do. So anyways, I tested at 82 and I just couldn't believe it. Actually, I thought the test was wrong or actually that two things went through my mind. That's wrong. Or there's something wrong with me. Like, how can it possibly be that high? So I, I tested again in a month and it was 76. So I, I said, okay, the test wasn't wrong. And, and, and this is in March. So I, I went down the rabbit hole. I was like, what, is, what, is, what am I doing that's resulting in this seemingly really good result? Uh, and I really think red light actually has a part of the, is part of the story. So um, I do red light every morning, Monday to Friday at around 8.30. And there's data showing that um, exposure to red and near infrared light uh, primes the body and reduces likelihood of burning. So that's the first thing. So that's a really interesting study because I think it's, you know, I, I do mindfully go out in the punishing sun during the day and try to get vitamin D. I mean, it's part of my, my routine. And I think I could just spend more time out there and, and, I, and I don't burn. And, and that's saying a lot in the Phoenix sun, especially in June. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, the other element to that is that it, red light is known to actually uh, thicken the skin. So, you know, you're actually making more skin cells. You're, you're upregulating the fibroblasts and you're making more collagen, you're making more skin cells. And so I really think that there's a knock-on effect from increased skin cells available to manufacture vitamin D. So there's, um, th- there's that element too, where I think I have thick skin, literally, 
And I'm, when I am in the sun, I'm able to maximize it and make more vitamin D than somebody that with less thicker, thicker yeah. skin. That's the so first those... thing I noticed was my skin. Oh, already? After, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. After, I think we've had it for a couple of weeks now, maybe a month or so too, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that's the first thing I noticed. Like, if, like the first couple of days, I was like, well, I feel like my skin just looks better. Even just after a couple of days of using it. I don't know if that's just my mind or what, but <laughs> I, I feel like I noticed the difference. We love N of ones around here. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's what matters to you, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you know, we, we can get, I mean, we can get bogged down in science and certainly the science is there, but at the end of the day, if the, the N equals one is what matters to you. And if you, if you feel like it's benefiting you, then it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and look, I, I mean, you know, as you said, the sun is kind of the double-edged sword, right? We need that for the vitamin D. We need that for the blue light. We need that for all of the things that you've mentioned. But conversely, you know, especially if we talk about environmental issues, you know, ozone problems, all of that, you know, the, we could end up, you know, hurting ourselves. So, you know, how do we offset that? Um, now, you mentioned you do Monday through Friday. Is there any, is there any evidence to suggest that the two days off ha is benefit, beneficial? You know, what, what's kind of your protocol with this? Uh, it's just, um, that's primarily, well, there's two things. Primarily my uh, strategy with all things is to try to introduce, mindfully introduce variation. So I don't like doing anything the same in any day, mm -hmm. any individual day, whether it's supplements or, or whatever, the, or exercise. Uh, and it's light exposure is kind of in the same bucket. Although I, I'm actually pretty regimented around how I approach mindful light exposure. Um, but uh, so, and it's also just because I have this massive setup here in the office. So I just jump in that Superman booth for, for eight to 10 minutes and I'm done. And I don't have that kind of setup at home yet. So it's just <laughs> yeah. more about availability and time savings. So I just take the weekends off typically. Makes sense. Gotcha. Um, now, one thing that I'm really curious about, Scott, is, is you know, there's kind of, you, you see varying um, companies talk about the exposure of red light for the eyes. And you guys have kind of said that with the, uh, with the infrared that, you know, you should use eye protection. So I'd, I'd love to kind of get Mido Red's take on this, what you guys are seeing, you know, uh, why eye protection versus no eye protection? Is it beneficial for the eyes? You know, I'd like to dive into the ocular rabbit hole if we could. Yes, no, I mean, this is a good one. We have an article coming out on this too, because I just, I get asked this a lot. And um, so I'm just writing a long article. I'm just going to defer people to the article. But um, so again, everything, it's all about dose, you know, and you can, you can have too much of anything, right? And you can, you can, I think you can drink enough water to kill yourself, right? So uh, it's the same concept with respect to red light. So there are a lot of good, there's a lot of good data out there with red light in particular being beneficial for eye health. Uh, there was an article in CNN uh, like six months ago. It's like three minutes of red light, eyes open, uh, improvements in macular degeneration. And there, there's a lot of studies like that. But unfortunately, in just, and, and part, of, part of our recommendations, frankly, are just from a, a business perspective. There's always an edge case of some idiot who's going to just try and do something stupid and, and you know, put a, a, the near-infrared LED up to his face for an hour or something. Yeah. Three and, minutes is good. Two hours is great. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and, and that's actually, I mean, that's very, um, again, more isn't necessarily better. And we could talk about the dosing side of things too. Um, but certainly with, with infrared, so there is something called infrared cataract. This is known. It was identified, I think in the eighties, they found increased incidence of cataract in, um, glass blowers and furnace workers. And part of that, they are tying, back to, you know, increase to in infrared light exposure to the eyes. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of confounding factors with a glass blower and a furnace worker, and, you know, the chemicals, the heat, you know, hours a day for decades, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a connection, but it is, a, it's a tortured connection, you know, so it, it exists, but, <laughs> yeah, right. It exists and it is, and theoretically possible. And so uh, we, in the article, you know, we, we, we kind of walk through that. Uh, with the power density of our lights and the recommended use, uh, I would say extremely unlikely that they, there, would, there would be any issues. But again, you know, there are edge cases. So, you know, we, we say, all right, you got the infrared right on in the face, you know, why, why not just throw on the goggles? And then you don't even have to worry about even like this remote possibility. And we are coming out with more of a translucent kind of cool looking shades, if you will. And so you'll be able to, because I don't really like wearing the goggles personally, because I don't. I have a problem standing still. So, and just, 
Um, I'm not a meditator, so I actually like <laughs> to do stuff. And, um, and so I would like to be able to see. And so I actually have, uh, actually, well, I currently use these. These are, I mean, these are, these are kind of like oh, okay. laser goggles. Yeah. But anyways, I, we're going to source something like this that we'll, we're going to, you know, we're constantly looking to improve. And so we're going to uh, source something like that and provide it to our customers. So they have the option of, you know, multitasking uh, while they're using the light. Very cool. Gotcha. Um, I have a question. So we've talked about red light. We've talked about blue light. Is there any therapeutic benefit to other colors? And is there a future to, you know, having these panels filled with another color versus red? Uh, well, p potentially. And so I, I've been asked a similar question in the past, like what's the, what's the, f the future of light therapy look like? And I, my futuristic vision is we have all, everybody has a pod in their home and the pod scans you in the morning you know, does diagnostics and then hits you with the amount with the wavelengths of light that you need for the day oh, I love based that. on, based on, you know, what's going mm -hmm. on in your body at that particular moment. So that's my futuristic version. Yeah. Uh, but yes, you know, like, uh, and I'm not an expert uh, in these other wavelengths, but I have seen studies with migraines and green light, for instance. And so uh, that, that seems interesting to me, but I think primarily, again, uh, most of the therapeutic devices are going to be with the six, to 1100 nanometer range, because that's the range where you get the penetration into the body where you can actually see the benefit. You know, if, the, if we can't deliver the medicine, uh, and I really shouldn't call it a medicine, I'm not, I don't make any claims whatsoever, we sell lights, but if you can't deliver the payload, then you're not gonna see the benefit is really the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. So if the light can't get in there, then it's, it can't confer benefit clearly. Right. And, and we certainly understand that we will put the uh, FDA claim in this, that uh, it's not <laughs> Thank intended you. to- It's on every email to... I send. It's all over yeah. my website. Uh, <laughs> the, the FDA bullshit claim. Um, and that's my take on this. Because, you know, the, the reality is, is that, you know, the, we know that the implementation timeframe for standard of care is 17 years in the medical field. So, you know, with the science emerging at the, at the pace that it does, there's every viable reason to consider these therapies as something that could deal with disease, even though the FDA doesn't want us to say that. And so, you know, we kind of get hamstrung and, and said, like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's good for sleep mm -hmm. when the potential right. goes beyond that. And of course, we never want to overpromise on some of these therapies. But, you know, when we really look at it across all of the research, there's so much research that says, you know, yeah, you should have a pot of these in your home. Totally agree. Totally agree. And, and again, at the end of the day, I, mean, we, I come from a, a very um, practical point of view where we're, modern life is, is causing some booby traps for us. And, you know, how can we just mindfully step around them, you know, or, or mindfully fill them in, you know, and, uh, and so I, this is definitely part of it, just in my mind, no question. And, and, and people can, you know, when they ask me, I, I usually say, you know, the best thing you can do is probably get a little bit more sun, most likely moderate amount of daily sun exposure, but it's just very difficult for modern humans to really work that in. And so again, mindful supplementation just makes so much sense just from that perspective. And then we can talk about a lot of the very cool studies, um, which, you know, make you really hopeful about its impact. Um, and so I, I, you mentioned sleep and I can get, I can give you a really interesting sleep study. Uh, I don't know if you, if you want to cover it real quick, let's do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So they did, um, so I get asked this question a lot too about what is the best time of the day to use it, and and my, generally I, I, my answer is I'm I'm a very again a very practical person when you're most likely to actually get it done right so that's my my general first pass answer and it's why I do it in the morning. However, uh, you know I get asked about you know well if it increases energy is that going to interfere with sleep? And so there was a very interesting study where they um, was a Chinese female basketball players a study from about seven years ago. And they actually did it in the evening. They, they radiated on this full body. Uh, it was 30 minutes. But if you actually look at the dose they gave, it'd be equivalent to about 15 minutes in front of our lights, uh, the joules. And we should probably cover that real quick, what, what a joule is and kind of how you want to think about dosing. Uh, but so anyway, 30 minutes. Uh, eyes were completely covered. That was literally a blinded experiment. So they had like those sleep masks on where they didn't know if they were getting the light or not. And in any case, massive in in increases in sleep quality score. Massive increases in um, a subjective sleep quality score, uh, massive increases in performance metrics. I mean, these were elite athletes and they were, uh, you know, their endurance was improving. And probably my favorite part was 67% increase in serum melatonin the following morning. Wow. 
which is non-trivial, you know, I mean, and if you really understand the melatonin is a whole nother thing, and I'm not a super expert on melatonin, but it is very important, not just for sleep quality. I mean, it's a, it's a real powerful antioxidant. It's important. It's involved with serotonin production. You talk about, you know, depression and all these things. So, I mean, a natural way to, to drive melatonin up that high, I think is absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Interesting. So, well, you know, so I do it and, and my morning protocol is, you know, I, I uh, get up in the morning, I grind my beans, pour my water from my French press, and then I go do red light. And then by the time that it's done, I've got the perfect cup of coffee. <laughs> but now I think I might have to start changing it to, to the nighttime. If, if well, this, uh, variation is good, right? I, I do think variation is good. So I, I, I tend to do it in the morning because I know it will get done. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but you know, I, I do try every once in a while to just to, to work it into the evening and you can do it twice a day. I mean, we generally say, again, this, it's a hormetic stress. So, uh, spacing it out at least six hours is kind of mm-hmm. our general recommendation, just like you wouldn't want to do, you know, these athletes doing two days, you know, they, you know, they wouldn't do it at 9am and then again at noon, usually they wait till the evening before they do the second workout. Right. Um, quick question on children and red light therapy. Any research or any recommendations, uh, warnings for, for kids? Yeah, so um, there's not a lot of research. So a kind of our strict company policy is, you know, uh, when in doubt, do is out, you know, and the, the, the kids, you know, how much do they really need? I mean, they're, uh, unfortunately, the modern kids are probably also very deficient in sunlight, so potentially that you could benefit. I think if somebody were going to try it, even though it isn't our, you know, recommended specifically by us, I would say use some common sense like you would with any, anything else and kind of adjust dose for weight. Uh, it would probably be like a good common sense approach, you know, and again, less is generally, less is more. Well, and, and the reason that I ask that, Scott, is, you know, you and I kind of came from similar backgrounds. It was, you know, Cinnamon Toast Crunch or Captain Crunch in the morning, uh, you know, or, you know, 17 pancakes with maple syrup. And then, you know, it was uh, any slew of horrible foods throughout the day. And so, you know, when we really look at the modern American diet, it hasn't changed that much, especially for our kids. So, you know, when we really start to look at optimizing health, you know, when it matters the most is, you know, is there a place for this? And, you know, obviously I'm not advocating for it. You know, Scott's not advocating for that, that we, you know, you could put your kid in front of a a mito red light for, you know, 20 minutes, but, you know, something to think about that as your kids might be indoors a little bit more distance learning as, as a result of, uh, you know, COVID um, that there could be a place for this. And so, you know, uh, um, you know, you know, me guys, it's like, I talk about my daughter all the time. She's actually jumped in front of this a couple of times, uh, you know, for like two to three minutes. And, you know, I think it's more just fun for her to feel like she's part of the, the bio optimization crowd. But, um, I, I think that there could be something for this, especially if we start looking at how unhealthy our kids are getting with all of the indoor screen time, no, no natural sunlight. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. I think, I, again, from a, from a business perspective, we have to be cautious. Uh, you know, if my son jumps in front of it for a few minutes, it's, I, I, it's, it's fine. You know, if he wants to be like that, I certainly don't stop him. But, um, but my son is, I can barely keep up with him as it is. So, you know, I, he's got plenty of energy and <laughs> I don't even, I don't know if I want him to have more ATP right. than he already has, you know, like, well, Hey, here's, uh, here's what I'm thinking about is, is before bad. the 67% increase yeah. in melatonin. That's what, you know, <laughs> like, well, I'm, 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 tra- I'm trying to figure out how I can put my seven year old to sleep faster. Right. <laughs> Got, so, uh, one, one question, you know, I, I didn't really want to get too much into the commercial side of things, but one thing I've noticed is that you guys seem to be very aggressively priced in the market compared to some of the other, uh, you know, red light devices. And I, I'm, I'd love to just kind of talk a little bit about that. I think that, you know, we've experienced your, your equipment, um, absolutely love it. And I think that by and large, people might look at that and say, well, you know, hey, is it, is it an inferior quality? But really, when we start talking about it, it's, it's the, you know, the frequencies, the, the nanometers, it's all the same. So, you know, how have you guys managed to create such an amazing product at a cost that's a little bit different than what people have come to expect in the marketplace? Um, well, a couple of things, you know, I, uh, I mean, I was in corporate America for a good 15 years. I was a finance guy, you know, I mean, and I was just self-taught on a lot of these things. Again, just trying to solve my own problems. And um, so, you know, I, I don't have any investors. I self-funded this thing. I bootstrapped it myself, essentially. Um, so, you know, not having investors um, and being able to bootstrap and build it organically, uh, there's a lot of flexibility there with, you know, how you, how you approach things. And, and really, we, I, I came into the market 
um, partially because I, I obviously believe in the technology and so it benefits myself and partially because I saw an opportunity because like you said, things are, um, I think, unnecessarily expensive. And so when we first came in, it was to just uh, the products that we offered were very budget. And now we've got, you know, we've got a couple of different series now, which, which cater more to you know, have some of the bells and whistles. But at the end of the day, like you said, it's not super complicated. I think um, there are nuances with respect to dosing and uh, you want to use the right wavelengths, you want the right power and you want the right duration. Those are the three kind of variables. Uh, but if you dial those in, um, it, it doesn't need to be super expensive. And I also just think part of our strategy too, I mean, there's no, there's no wholesaling. We're a direct to consumer company. People ask me about wholesale. I cannot afford to wholesale. The margins just aren't there the way that we're building out our strategy. So, you know, we forego that, that potential. And then we're thinking about trying to get into the commercial market with that new product that I um, discussed earlier. And, you know, we're having some challenges about how to price that and still make it work. Um, so, but in any case, you know, my, my thought was um, there was an opportunity there to offer something that could provide similar benefit or same benefit or better benefit at less cost. We came in that way. And now we're kind of, you know, we're kind of just running with it. Cool. Well, yeah. it's an amazing product. Um, so, you know, we're, we're happy to share that with our audience and, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, make sure to check the show notes. Cause we, uh, you know, we have all of the information on how you can order your Mito red. Um, I've got one final question. Do you, do you have anything else? No, I'm good. So here's, here's my question. I'm looking at the, the model behind you standing in front of the lights and she's fully clothed. Now, is that for <laughs> purposes or do you actually, can you wear clothes and get benefit out of, out of the light? Uh, well, both, you know, I, you know, I mean, we could have closed her or we could have, you know, had the blurs like you were mentioning earlier. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, the, um, so the red light won't penetrate closing, right? I mean, it's only going to go a couple millimeters into the skin. The near infrared will, I mean, the near infrared goes through bone, so it's going to go through yeah. the clothing and it'll, it'll get through to some degree, but I think ideal state is, you know, let's not have anything between, between you and the device other than six to 12 inches of air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, Mito Red and Complete Human are encouraging you to get naked. <laughs> get naked and get red. Get naked and get red. Um, Scott, thank you so very much for, for uh, taking the time. Uh, obviously, we've been talking a lot about red light for a long time, photobiomodulation. I, I think this answered a lot of questions for us, for our audience, who really just wanted to understand, what the hell is this? Am I just star staring in front of a red light for a little bit or standing in front of a red light? Or is there some, uh, some value? We know that there's value. And I think that uh, you know, our audience is going to get a lot out of this conversation as far as understanding what they can do. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, guys, we, we highly encourage you to pick up your own device, right? Like there's all these different places you can go they're hyper expensive to go like buy a package why not have this thing at your house and the cool thing about mito uh, red is, is they've got a bunch of different platform or a bunch of different products on their website so check that out check out the show notes um i, I think there's real value here guys and, and we're the more research that comes out the more we're going to recognize that this is something that as he said you know intelligent supplementation is is always going to be in your best interest mm -hmm. amen Scott. really appreciate that and I, just one other thing in closing I, if anybody has any additional questions and wants to dive deeper in the science you know we do have some blog posts and we're, we're constantly adding new uh information on the site and then uh there we actually have this amazing database anybody that really wants to go into the weeds uh, it's on our site it's in the faq section you can it's in an excel spreadsheet you can download it there's over 5,000 lines 5,000 studies in this sheet and the beautiful thing about having it in a spreadsheet is you can sort it so whatever you're curious to learn about you want to learn about brain health you want to learn about skin you want to learn about uh, uh, pain. Uh, it's fully categorized and you can sort and filter and see, you know, okay, what, what was the study? And it's very, and what wavelengths did they use? What power did they use? What was the result? It's really an amazing resource for anybody that wants to kind of go uh, down into the, into the weeds and into the science on the topic. And that's yeah, pretty crazy, that. right? Because, you know, you think about like, uh, you know, omega-3s or, or aspirin, which are some of the most, you know, studied uh, products out there. You know, realistically, in all the research that I did, the first use of, you know, red light or near-infrared light therapy was in 1967. And it was a, mm -hmm. I think it was a German guy who wanted to see if he could give rats cancer, but he found out it actually grew hair. Was that some, is that? That, that rings a bell. That may, uh, I don't know exactly, but that does ring a bell. 
Yeah. So anyway, so if we've gone from 1967 to now with 5,000 studies and, and we've barely scratched the surface, you know, what's the potential of this? So, you know, I, I can't wait for the next, you know, 15 years as all this research becomes available and we can kind of see what this stuff does above and beyond what we already know. So some cool stuff. We'll definitely add that to the show notes, guys. So check it out. We know a lot of you are data junkies just like us. So uh, I, I know what I'm going to be doing this afternoon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, amazing. A dork by my own heart. <laughs> love it cool scott thank you so much we really appreciate it thank you scott all right thank you take care all right ladies and gentlemen thank you for tuning in to another edition of the complete human podcast with your host jana breslin and evan demarco we will see you next week bye everyone